are in this phase of life where things are weird and things are strange and a lot of people have a lot of fears and we need to be able to bring them an eternal hope in the midst of those fearful times. I was encouraging you on Sunday to be people who really give that fire to other people, the fire of the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's what we're talking about. Well, today I want to take you to a second story. It's a story of a man named Cornelius and the Apostle Peter. And it's a story that I think tells us a lot about what it means to be the kind of people who are really ready to bring the message of Jesus to others. And so I wanted to share it with you, and I just didn't have time on Sunday. So if you could, turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 10. And we're going to be looking at, in Acts chapter 10, we're going to look at verse 1. We're going to read some selections. I'm going to skip over a few verses, explain to you what's going on, and then make a few points along the way. So go there with me if you would. It says this in Acts chapter 10, verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day, at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius? Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was, at one, who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. So here's Cornelius, and he has gotten a vision. Now, the thing you need to know about Cornelius is what Luke starts with. Luke starts with this idea that Cornelius was a good man. He was a God-fearing man. And Luke, who isn't a Jew, he's a Gentile, he wants us, the readers, to know that this guy Cornelius was a good man. He was a God-fearing man. He was a praying man. He was a man who had done good things for the poor. Everything that could be the external mark of a good guy, Cornelius was that. Of course, there's a problem. The biggest problem is that Cornelius was a Gentile. Cornelius was not a Jew. And for the Jewish people, it's very important that you and I remember this, for the Jewish people, being a good person was good, but not good enough. See, you weren't going to be able to get into a relationship with God by just being good. That wasn't the thing to do. In order to have a relationship with God, you had to be a good Jew. You had to follow all the Jewish rules. And some of those rules weren't about morality. Some of those rules were about rituals. And so for the Jewish people, you could be good, but you weren't good enough unless you were also a Jew. Cornelius was not a Jew. And so now this angel comes and Cornelius has to be surprised. Why in the world would the angel be talking to him? He's not a Jew. He doesn't deserve to have that kind of a, a attention from God. And now the angel says, I want you to go find a man named Peter and reach out to him to come to tell you about something. And Cornelius is like, well, what is, what is this guy going to be telling me about? Well, he doesn't know. So he sends to Peter. Pick it up in verse 9. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. So Peter replies, surely not, Lord. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. Now, as a kid, I remember hearing that passage and thinking that was weird. Why would I want to kill an animal when food was getting prepared downstairs for me anyway? But for Peter, this was doubly weird because the animals he saw on that sheet were animals he wasn't allowed to eat. He was a Jew. He was not allowed to eat any of these unclean animals. Apparently, this sheet had things on it like bacon and, and uh, had things on it like lobster and other foods that were not allowed for Jewish people to eat. 
And the vision says, go ahead, eat it. And Peter says, no, I'm not going to do that. It's unclean. I'm not going to do that. But the voice says, don't call something unclean that I've called clean. And it happens three times. Hint, hint, Peter, there are things that you think are good that are not good, and there are things that you think are bad that are good. Hint, hint, Peter, there might be some things about this Old Testament regulation that you have to think differently about. Now, when it comes to food, we already know that earlier in the Gospels, it's recorded that Jesus declared all foods clean. But Peter is about to be confronted with something that isn't about food. Verse 17 says this, While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. And now we know the vision wasn't about food. The vision was about people. God says, I'm going to bring food into your life? No. I'm going to bring animals into your life? No. I'm going to bring people into your life. And when they show up, don't declare them unclean. When they show up, go with them without hesitating. Go with them, for I have sent them. Now, what happens next is Peter invites them in. They stay there for a day. Then it takes them a day-long journey. And eventually they reach the house of Cornelius. We're picking up the story in verse 25. It says this, As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I'm only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? This is the way we naturally operate. We think there are people who are in and people who are out. We think there are people that we should pay attention to and people that we shouldn't pay attention to. We think there are people who are worth our time and other people who aren't worth our time. Peter's first words when he talks to these people, he says, listen, you know I'm a Jew. You're a Gentile. You know that I'm not allowed to be here. But God has told me that I shouldn't prejudge anyone. See, a lot of our problems when it comes to sharing our faith is prejudice. We ask ourselves the question, is that person worth my risk? Is that person worth my inconvenience? Can God really have a plan for them? Can God's plan for them possibly really require me? Watch what happens next. Cornelius explains to Peter the vision that he had. He explains to Peter why he called for Peter. And so then we pick it up again in verse 34. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who's Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. (laughs) and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Notice, even though it took me a little while to read that, notice how incredibly simple this message was. Peter says, You've already heard the message of Jesus. You know he was a man who did miracles. 
You've already heard that he was crucified. What you need to know is that his resurrection is not a rumor. His resurrection is something I have experienced. I have seen it. And because of his resurrection, I know that forgiveness is now available to everybody. Peter just says, let me tell you what happened. Peter then says, let me tell you what I experienced. And then he says, and let me tell you what it means for you. It's a very simple message. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to be able to understand this. You've heard the message of Jesus. Let me tell you the message of Jesus again. He lived. He performed miracles. He was compassionate. He spoke love to people. And then he claimed to be God. He was crucified for it. But he rose again on the third day, proving his claim true. And we have seen it. We've experienced it. There are eyewitnesses. And for you, it means forgiveness. It's a very simple message. Look what happens next, verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who'd come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Our problem is we tend to evaluate people on whether or not they're worthy to receive the message of Jesus. We evaluate people on whether they're worthy to be risked for, whether it's worthy for us to take a risk to bring the message to them. Here's the point. No matter who that other person is, God has a plan for them. And part of God's plan for them requires me. But that part's really easy. All I have to do is say, this is what I know. This is what I've experienced. This is what it could mean for you. Peter never even asked the people to respond. Peter never even said, today you need to ask for forgiveness. Peter never even said, today would you like to pray a prayer with me? What Peter did is he said, this message can bring forgiveness to anyone who believes. And that's the last word of instruction Peter had. Because immediately after that, Cornelius and his household received the Holy Spirit in a miraculous way. Their life was changed. And Peter said, well, if their life is changed like this, exactly the same way the Holy Spirit changed me, they should be baptized and welcomed into the family too. Here's Peter's point. God can do in them exactly what he did in me. I will welcome them. I encourage you to take the same attitude. God has a plan for the other people in your life, no matter who they are. God's plan for them requires you. It's why you're part of their life. And your part is really easy. Just bring them the message of forgiveness through Jesus. And watch as God changes their heart. Maybe not immediately, maybe over time, maybe over a long time. And for some people, maybe even never. But your part is easy. Give God the opportunity to do his part. Take advantage of this. Take advantage of this, especially in this time when people are hungry for connection, when people are hungry for an eternal hope in the midst of a temporary fear. This is your chance. This is your opportunity. Bring Jesus to someone who would be blessed by him. God bless you as you do so. Let me pray for you. God, we ask that you would help us all to be people who courageously bring the message of Jesus to people without prejudging them beforehand. We know you've got a plan for them. We know your plan for them requires us. And we know that our part is really pretty easy. Help us to do our part well. Thank you, God. Give us your strength and your spirit to do our part well. In Jesus' name, amen.